Welcome to the Lighthouse Conversations, a show featuring entrepreneurs and tastemakers from the worlds of art, culture, tech, and of course, food. I'm your host, Hesha Montazer. I'm joined on today's episode by Sasha Tonchev, who is the Chief Soul Kitchen Officer and founder of restaurant 21 Grams. 21 Grams describes itself as a family style and neighborhood bistro that brings you honest yet daring Balkan soul food. I've been a fan of the place ever since it opened, both for the food and the aesthetics. 21 Grams won several awards and was recently featured in the FT's How to Spend It. And if any of you know me, you'll know how jealous this makes me. This is a bit of a tangent, but I've got to tell you, I've been obsessed with the FT since I was, I can't even remember. I've been especially obsessed with the FT's How to Spend It, despite the terrible name, and more so with lunch with the FT. So if you have any connection with the FT, please call them and ask them to invite me to lunch. Thank you. Back to Stasha. Stasha was not well known in the F&B industry when she decided to branch out on her own and took some enormous risks to reach her goal of having her own restaurant. So naturally, I was intrigued by her story and wanted to understand what motivated this, some would say, reckless move. And even before that, what motivated her relocation to Dubai with a couple of hundred euros in her pocket, leaving her life in Serbia behind? There's quite a bit of learning in this episode, and I've learned, among other things, how this Dubai flagship Balkan spot got its name. I am so excited to have you here. I, I'm very excited and honored to be here. I've been following you. I've been, I've been listening to your podcast for years, and <laughs> it's a great opportunity. You are very kind, and uh, honestly, I, I feel I'm going to jump right in because we have so much material to cover, and there's so much that I don't know about you that I want to find out, and my listeners want as well. I'll start with something you shared offline just a few minutes ago. Bring me back to the moment when you came to Dubai and you told me that you came with, you know, 250 euros in your pocket. Um, arrived One suitcase. Here with a suitcase, a suitcase, and arrived as part of the pre-opening team for Armani Hotel. First of all, walk me through the decision to leave Serbia where you grew up, to come here, and how did that come about? Well... Uh, yes, I grew up in Serbia and I came here at the age of 27, as you mentioned, 250 euros in my pocket, one suitcase, big dreams. I was chasing opportunity. Mm. This and is you always had big dreams, sorry to interrupt. Were you always that way growing up in Serbia? I mean, were you always someone that wanted to do more, that was ambitious, or that happened sort of towards the end of your 20s? No, I definitely, I always been a person that wanted to do more. Was driven. And that someone who's seeking for more, not just like taking what's there, but seeking to see, you know, what's... what's Out there. Out there, yes. So I was there, and, and that comes from my family, I have to say, right? I'm coming from the parents that are business owners, right? And they are, they've been business owners for 35 years what? What kind of business? Um, they started as, um, they're actually the people that opened the first kids wear store in our region. Oh, wow. And I have to picture this, I have to paint this picture for you. You know, just imagine 1987, 1988, it's Yugoslavia, it's the, one of the most powerful countries in the world. At the time. And the life is good, life is easy. Um, our parents, the generation of my parents, they have everything they want, secure jobs, good salaries, good lifestyle, everything. But... Winds of change are blowing from all directions, right? Uh, the Berlin Wall is just about to fall. Uh, the civil war in Bosnia is just to, to happen. And many, many people don't see it, right? My father did. He knew that things will change. And what we had at that time in Yugoslavia is not sustainable. And he was seeking for the, for the options to, to secure the family and our livelihoods. And he saw that private business is way to go forward. Unfortunately, he didn't have a funds to start it, but he knew that that's the way forward. At the same time, my mother really wanted to, she's, she's been working in the only department store for a kids wear uh, back, uh, back in Serbia. And she really wanted to create a special selection of kids wear and brands uh, in our place. And everyone, everyone said, no, don't do it. Like what you, what you were saying, like private business now, like work, like, where do where are, you, where are you going to get the money? How are you going to do it? Why are you doing that? Like, and they did it together? They did it together. Oh, wow. They did it together. And they did it in a way that I, as a kid of, at that time, I was five, six years old. I lived in an apartment without drugs, without TV, without piece of furniture, because they sold everything they could possibly <laughs> sold to, 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 to start the business. Were you, did you have siblings? Uh, yes, I do have. I have 10 years older sister. And okay. I'm the youngest in my family as well. I'm that little wagon that is behind everyone. Uh, so just going back to the background and, and the mindset as well, yeah. I've seen that firsthand from my parents. What does it mean to, to, 
to chase your dreams, to, to, fo to follow your dreams, to, to, to take the opportunities, to, to be brave about them, to go against the odds, to go against what people say, what people think. If you think it's the right thing to do, you do it. And by the time you were leaving at 27, mm. how long have your parents had been in, in that business, running that business? So my parents have been in the business since um, 1989. I came here in 2010. Do your math, it's like 30 years. Um, so the business was doing well? In that case. Not really. Not ah. really. Well, they started that business. They've been very successful. Then we got the, uh, the board, then we got the, the bomb shooting. Things changed. And my parents, from the, from the kids' wear business, went into the building material business, into the agricultural business. Oh, and wow. currently, they have the, a, a very successful chicken farm. <laughs> Amazing. Okay, so, so they are true entrepreneurs. Th they are 100%. Mean, this reminds me of the stories you hear about the Lebanese Civil War. You know, people started in this and ended up there because they had to just make ends meet. But, you know, you look at how entrepreneurial Lebanese people generally are, and it's partially because of their circumstances. Uh, exactly. But for, for them, especially for my father, is the way of, of living. Of living. He can't. Like, there was a point, now he's 70 plus, right? And there were points then where he actually supposed to stop, right? And he could. But he could not. Yeah. That's that's the thing. It's in his blood to seek for a pure opportunity to to do more, and that's it. To try the things. So how did he react when you told him, "I'm off. Bye bye, bye, Papa. He I'm was up to Dubai." Pissed. Yeah, was pissed because of the op the job description Exa or because you're leaving. See, like we didn't say that I came here to work as a hostess in a restaurant, right? Yes. I, w I was not on the senior position or whatever. And previously, of course, I, you were 27. Yes, I have a bachelor in economics, right? I finished the university. I worked in marketing events. I had a really good job, good lifestyle in Serbia. But Serbia, being Serbia, did couldn't give me more, couldn't give me opportunities that I was seeking. And it's not a lot of opportunity, unlike Dubai that I've seen as a, as a place where I can do more. And um, when I told them, him, that I'm leaving, he was very pissed. He was very upset and he didn't speak to me for months. Wow. He couldn't process the idea that I'm leaving uh, the country. And first of all, that I'm leaving the country, right? That's the first thing, like, yeah. you know, your child is and just going. And then he thought of a hostess job as sort of uh, the meeting exactly. given your qualification. It's very Arab of him, no, by the way. He pulled uh, an Arab card here. I told you, it's we called. have a very, very much in, in common. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so he, he couldn't process that idea. Mm. Like, I'm going to settle for less. Mm. And he could provide me so much. And he did already provide so much for me. There was, a, I have to say, there were some great opportunities for me in Serbia, but we with his help, which yeah. I didn't want. Didn't want. I didn't want, and he felt left out, right? Like, he felt like maybe his daughter, for the first time, doesn't need his help. Ah. So it was a power move here uh, as well. Probably, mm. probably. So, which, is, which is normal. Yeah, but then I proved, I proved that he was wrong. Uh, as I told you, I was promoted four times within 100, uh, sorry, <laughs> within a year and a half. So from the, hostess, uh, from the hostess in the restaurant, I became the senior hostess, I became the manager of the reservation uh, department, and then moved to the PR and marketing. And then later on, I moved as a head of uh, reservation and reception at Hakkasan. So I, I got my career path really quickly. I, I got it sorted very, very quickly and proved him, okay, you know, even if you start very low, I can move up quickly. Do you feel that that period working in restaurants and in hospitality is part of what gave you the confidence to then start your own business? In other words, would you have started this business if you had not had that experience? Hmm. Um, I think I would start a business. A business. A business, but for sure. But not this business. But not this business. And Honestly, working in the f &B here in this industry was not a really a very reason why I end up again in, in the in the f &B industry. Um, maybe just the just that notion that I could do something differently in mm. f and industry. Mm. This this was my. Drive. You saw this even then. Yes. Because you worked for big companies. Yes, I worked for a big companies. I mean, and I have Armani, to say, Kassan, these are not small companies. Exactly. And even I just mentioned their names. I, I have to say that I was not happy there. Mm. And I was not happy how I was treated as, a, as their employee. And especially someone who really has a great deal of passion and love for that job and for this industry, right? Do you think this was specific to you? Or you feel this is a general comment about it's the F&B industry and how they treat employees? It's a general, it's absolutely general uh, place 
four people working and you just just do a few interviews <laughs> for a restaurant stuff and you you you'll realize that you actually are there not as someone who is conducting interview you're a therapist for these people <laughs> honestly that 20 30 minutes spending with the people from the industry coming in looking for a new opportunity or job is more as a therapy than interview <laughs> did you think it had to do uh, with the fact that you were a woman or less so or generally speaking, that's just... Uh, not not really. Not no, really. I, I have so to say... So it wasn't gender specific necessarily. I mean, I would imagine people here would perceive you more as white, quote unquote. Well, I am white, yeah, exactly. yes. So, so I'm saying, so you wouldn't have that. No, because we see but a lot of But don't forget, bias. I'm a black person of the Europe. I'm from yeah, the exactly, Balkans, exactly, right? So exactly. the Balkans are You're kind the of... the least white in a white continent. Exactly, yeah. no, exactly. Not, and not that. very privileged. So. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know that feeling. And honestly, no, I, di I didn't feel that way. I, I didn't feel that it was any, that does have anything with the gender or nationality or where I come from. It's a, really a very common place in the FM industry that I personally don't like and that I really try my best and work very hard that I bring that little change to 21 grams. That people are really uh, treated a bit differently, that they're seen, that they're heard, that we support people that have love and passion for this, that they're here to stay. This was my problem. I love the industry. I really wanted to, to stay in that business, to stay in these restaurants, but no one did anything for me to encourage me, to motivate me to stay. Industry, as I told you, the industry is a great place for anyone who doesn't want to stay as a stepping stone. You come, you work here, you get your, you, you get and yourself you settled on. in and you move on and you just move and you change the industry or whatever. And it's a great place for them. And it's a really awful place for whoever actually wants to stay. You obviously defied all of that and still decided to go into it and do it for yourself. A couple of questions here. First of all, how did you come up with the name 21 grams, which is brilliant, by the way? Okay, so you know what 21 grams stands for? No. It's It's an urban meat that uh, human soul weighs 21 grams. So, oh, yes. Interesting. There was a scientist 100 years ago that measured the human body immediately um, before and after the death. Mm. And in so many cases... Um, 21 grams was lost uh, immediately after the death, which he assumed is the weight of human soul, right? And for a short while, it was even official theory. But in the meantime, we just got a How urban... cool. Yeah. You don't explain that completely. I mean, when I went on the website and all of that, I try to understand, but it's not... It's there. Ah, it was there. I it's there. It. You, yeah, exactly. Okay, you sure. didn't, don't you, judge. You didn't do it. your Happens. homework. I usually do yeah. my homework. I missed it. But it's judging us up. See, sure, the 21 grams for me was like that subtle way of communicating who we are, what we do, and why we are doing that, right? If we say that we are a place that make and serve soul food, that we are a place that... Uh, we want to feed people's soul, then 21 grams is a perfect uh, name, at least in my opinion. That it's a beautiful says name. It's a fantastic sum, name. That. I think it's great now that I know the story, which I missed before. Yeah. <laughs> That's, um, it's fine. It's always and it makes a, a great question. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Thank and you. it's a, a great conversation starter. It is a conversation starter. Not so, that we need one, but absolutely. How did you decide to go on your own? I mean, we were talking about this a bit earlier, you know, to start your own business, you need resources, financial, you need um, a lot of things. Um, and you had you at the a lot time, of courage. You, yeah, you, yeah, a lot of courage, exactly, yeah. I was gonna get to that. So you had worked in FMB for a while, you went and had a marketing job, and then what happened? How did you get to the 21 But I, I actually have to start much earlier than any job I had in my life, and I really, really think that everything I did in my life led me to 21 grams. So. Um, as you might know, I started cooking when I was seven years old. Yes, that part I, I found. Yes, so this is the thing. When my parents were running the business and being like many hours away from our home, I had a, all the freedom and access to the kitchen. And instead of making a mess or whatever, playing with other kids, I was taking the, my mom's uh, magazine, taking the recipes and start cooking. And I actually was good at that. But I actually felt that that's not enough. And the first time when I realized that I'm doing this well and the food I'm doing is good, I invited all the kids from my block. So wow. we start having the feasts and lunches at my tiny kitchen at that time every single day. Oh my God, you had many 21 grams at seven. Exactly. And th this is the thing, like that was that kind of <laughs> early, early realization. <laughs> early. Exactly. But you make food and you bring people together over the food. This is what I did. 
And I did that for months. Then my fa- my my parents they found out and did. They, they, but you're running they, a restaurant on the exactly, side. Exactly, and they didn't really like it, and you know they didn't support it at that time. But it didn't stop me. Uh, at the age of eight and nine, I already did like a proper lunches and dinners and spaghetti bolognese and moussakas and traditional dishes. Stop and, it. Yes, and I told you like at age of eighteen, I was saving my money not for uh, dresses or bags or going out. I was saving my money to go to bazaar in Cairo to get spices. I love so that story. I was foodie way before the term was there. Well, first of all, I'm going to tell you that my daughter who's six, I'm going to go home now. I'm going to tell her, what are you doing? Like she, cook. she has not cooked spaghetti bolognese. She hasn't done anything. What, what is she doing? She Completely doesn't have to. slacking off. Nah. Absolutely. She will. <laughs> Starting tomorrow, kofta on the menu. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no. But see how unlucky I was that that talent was not recognized and it was not nurtured either. So I, I think you know, it was because I think you knew how to defy the odds. It, it, and you felt a taste of success probably in some ways, funnily enough, right? But, you know, can you imagine now you have a daughter of six and you're, she starts cooking. What would you do next? Would you guide her? Would you direct like, so, okay, let's start probably some cooking courses. Let me see if, when she's at age of 15, maybe she can start working in my restaurant, my friend's restaurant or whatever. For me, that's never, it was never a case. But isn't that part of it? The whole point that... You had to defy some certain odds, right? Maybe that's part of, you know what I mean? Like part of, because when you told the story, sorry, I don't want to become a yeah. psychologist, but also your dad's story, is, I think there seems to be a little bit of kind of, I can prove you wrong part of your personality. The very big part of my personality <laughs> okay. is that, like, okay. you know, spite is a guess. big, big part of my personality. Yeah. So, yes. Um, but, you know, I'm just talking in the sense that, you know, I sometimes I, I feel sorry that, you know, I had that really talent and I had a great passion, uh, but no one ever said, Stasha, do you think of becoming a chef? Yeah. Absolutely. That was not on the table because back in the, the days in Serbia and where I come from, being a chef isn't a good thing. Yeah, it's not right. a profession. It's a vocation at its best. And you go to cooking school if you're a bad student and you go working in the restaurant if you're a bad student or, you know, you, do, you don't have... Yeah, and there were no celebrity chefs and restaurant around chefs and no. all of that stuff started much later. Exactly. And, you know, it's for me to... To be kind of in the in, in the F&B industry or do something with this talent came very, very late. I wish I had this insights in who I am and what I want to do much earlier. But again, I didn't. And, you know, as I said, whatever I did in my life actually led, led me to 21 grams. So how did this come about? Let's, let me put it. So we are not very romantic about the entire thing. Yes, I had a great love for and passion for cooking and food and bringing up people together. Then I got some of the experience. And what kind of experience I got, right? Working in, in these big places, in a big restaurant. It's very different than this romanticized. Exactly. And I got the insight into this market. Where else than in Dubai, right? And then uh, I didn't like it. Yeah. But it was a food for thought. For many, many years, I kept thinking what I could done differently what I could do differently for the market for the people for the teams like it been in my mind and it's been very vocal people know like we go to the restaurant I've been I, I would be the one commenting on things noticing observing whatnot and one of the very uh beside like uh, observing the atmosphere and and the flow and the operation I always ask myself um what if instead of the croissant and espresso, we had um, work cheese and Turkish coffee? Would that work? And I've seen a great potential there. I really seen a great potential and I really start thinking of having a Balkan restaurant in, in Dubai. And, but not just like a, you know, just a place where you make and serve Balkan food, which, you know, didn't even sound very sane at that time. I just actually needed a platform to promote Balkan cuisine and to introduce, not promote, like promote is a very next step, right? It's, it's basically... Yeah, introduce. Introduce, that's something that people are completely not aware of. But it's obviously very similar in many ways to a lot of the cuisines we have in this part of the world. It is. And in many, I mean, when I go to you and I look at your breakfast or your lunch menu or, or your entire menu, so many of the dishes that I either know or know another version of where I grew up in Egypt. But only when you try it. Yes. By the name, you would know it. Not from the name, from when I try it. So my point is, um, was that a selling point to you? In other words, because you're in Dubai and you know there's obviously a lot of people coming from the Middle East and Arab countries and whatnot, the Mediterranean countries, you were brave enough to do that? Um, 
Or yes. did that not matter? You would have wanted to promote um, Balkan food anyway, no matter where uh, you were. The second. The, the I would second. promote it anyway. Yes, okay. I knew and we seen the similar similarities with other cuisines. And obviously, there was there are these big influences of uh, big cuisines to Balkan cuisines. So I know where, where is the common ground, yeah, right? And, and remember, sorry to interrupt you, I mean, a lot yeah. of our, Egypt included, were invaded by the Ottomans, have that heritage, Turkic heritage, Ottoman heritage. So this is a commonality that the whole... Balkan has been 500 years exactly. under the Ottoman rule. So exactly. obviously we got so much from them and the Turkish cuisine now is very famous exactly. and people know their dishes. But as well, we have the great influence from the Mediterranean countries, right? Because we, we have countries uh, uh, with the, uh, on the Adriatic coast, right? 100%. So everything. And Central European cuisine, Hungarian, Austrian, German, and people know these cuisines and they know these dishes. But <laughs> unfortunately, they don't know anything about the Balkan, which is a beautiful mix of, of these. And I felt I have to do something about that. I, I don't know if it's humble to, to say for myself that I, you know, I'm that person that... You are that person. At the end of the day, yes, I am, you know, I, I have to say, I, I joke very, um, very often and ask, like, how many times people in Dubai heard about Balkan before 21 grams and after 21 grams? Big difference, no doubt. Yeah, hu huge difference. And you're going against two double whammies. A, it's not a very well-known uh, food... Uh, Balkan food. And number two, you're going against stereotypes. And there are stereotypes about Serbia, for sure. There are stereotypes generally about Central and Eastern Europe. As you said earlier, I mean, you also come from a war-torn region. Mm. Uh, so you had to go against all of that as well to try to make something that's soulful, positive, happy. And defy the stereotypes. I mean, this is not that's, easy feat. It's not. And honestly, I think when I look at back our equation... At that time, was more sad to fail than to succeed. Indeed, yes. You no, know, unknown Correct. cuisine, unknown team. I didn't have celebrity chef. I was not celebrity. No one knew yeah. us. We literally were like no one from nowhere. With cuisine that no one knows, the menu that doesn't have a burger, pasta, a pizza, avocado, burrata, nothing. Correct. Right? We opened at a little corner in Jumeirah. We came up with this idea. We put it together and say, hello world, we are here. When we come back, we're going to hear Stasha's thoughts on work-life balance or the non-existence of work-life balance and why we should be talking more openly about mental health, especially among entrepreneurs. Welcome back. I'm Hesha Montasser, and you're listening to the Lighthouse Conversations with my guest, Stasha Tonchev. Do you see yourself a little bit as an ambassador? Oh, I am. I am. I'm waiting for the government, one of the governments from 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 the <laughs> Balkan region to to come to me and say, Stasha. No one has called you for the ambassadorship no, yet. No, no. And I'm upset. Yeah, I have no, to say. Be. I have yeah. to say. Well, I mean, I can have the Egyptian government call you if that's what you're interested in. Uh, you can not give you really. One. I want one of the Bal I, I <laughs> want right one then. of the Balkan <laughs> Balkan governments to come to me and at least say, Sasha, well done, because I I can't you tell you received that call yet. how many how many tickets and flights have been booked to one of the Balkan countries from 21 grams. So after, just after they were trying our food or talking to us or knowing us and they're saying, okay, yalla, I want to go. I want to go, I want to try, the, I want to see this place, I want to know this place better, I'm traveling. And I, I, I actually mean that. So could you see yourself, because you look at 21 grams and not just a restaurant, um, potentially kind of doubling down and, you know, maybe doing events, doing activations, things that provide further understanding of the culture, whether it's Serbian or Balkan in general, vis-a-vis -vis just come, coming and eating. Could you see yourself doing that? Could you see the space being activated by doing, I don't know, talks or movies? or? But the space it is exactly that. Since the beginning, we've been telling this story and telling more about the Balkans, not just through the food, yeah, through the design, through the through through so but many. But doing actual activations, like me, you know, uh, I don't know, four uh, four p.m. Okay. Thursday afternoon, you know, there's a movie that will inform something, yes. and then yes. maybe director that's explaining his point of view. I'm yes. just thinking loud. Yes, and we're just actually about to start that. So from the first of April, we're gonna have the series of events where we're gonna start with the Balkan music. So we're exactly. gonna have the Balkan musicians. The next, the very next thing are the movies. We want some of the poetry readings as well to to happen, um, but. Again, I really 
trust into these simple little things that are done daily more than one event that's going to happen once a month, once a week, or whatever. You know, what you do, the little things that you do daily are more important than one activation or one event or whatever is there. It, it's going to have bigger and better impact and will reach more hearts than any of the events, in my humble opinion. Do you see yourself as a creative person or as a business person or a combination of the two? What is in your oh, heart when you look at yourself? I'm a creative person. Creative person. I, yes, I'm like I'm. <laughs> I, I'm a creative person by by nature and business person. Secondly. Secondly, and mostly like as a collateral damage. <laughs> <laughs> no, honestly, right? You know, for me, it's very funny. People would tell and refer to me as a businesswoman, and <laughs> I don't really feel as a businesswoman, even if I run a business for the past five years, and obviously I'm still here, so I do That's it fantastic, somehow yeah. well. Uh, I don't see my, I don't look at the mirror and see Stasha business person, businesswoman. No, because I don't. Because you do what you love. And by association, it's successful, which is great. So you kind of, and people want to label you also, remember. I mean, it's, you, we always want to label. You know, I was yeah. a banker for many years when I left. People didn't know what to do with me because they could no longer call me banker. So like, what are you doing now? I'm like, mm, give me a few years, I'll come back to you. That's fine. No, I'm but just... People like labels. It's easy. They, yes. And okay, they, they have to, to give the titles exactly. and refer to something. And But I'm just saying that I don't feel as a business person because at the end of the day, I'm not business driven at all. At all. For me, I'm, if I can put it that way, I'm really, really experience driven. And everything I do is very experience driven. And it happens, you know, if I want to do this job at this scale or just if I want to do what I like to do which is serving food, bringing people together. I need to have a, a this scale. So more than my friends and family, I need to earn some money to cover the cost, meaning I need to run the business. And what motivated your uh, interest in also being in timeout, which is a different type of animal? Well, it, I have to say, before they approached me, I really thought about, I, you know, a, a option being there and like what we could bring to Time Out Market and what Time Out Market could bring to yeah. us. Yes, yeah, I'm very well. curious about this because you're very experiential, as you said. The experience is a very important part. Yeah. So now you're going into a place where the experience is predefined in a way, mm -hmm. not fully, but to and some it's extent. And self-service place, right? And it's self-service as well, exactly. So that yeah. element that you spoke about, the Stasha and the, the many Stashas, call it that for a minute, that are there that give you this feeling, that's not there. So how did you think about this? Then we went back to the food, right? Mm. As a language, as as a medium for communication, right? So 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 far, I think our focus were on actual conversation, like through the service, right? Through through these little chats that we had with our guests. But then, time out market. It's about the food. It is about food, and it's right? a brilliant vehicle for that. Exactly, but it's a great test for us 100%. to understand how our food is it strong enough to to go to a broader audience. Exactly, exactly. Did you? tweak anything or you just took your dishes as is took the best sellers or classics and put them there yes we took our best sellers and classic we tweaked them a, a bit just to kind of adjust to the operation and the kitchen size over there and the, the menu size as well but beside that these are the staples of the balkan experience experience and, and street how food has as the well. initial reaction been i think it was a, we, we got amazing response like amazing. my first fear was like what if the people start comparing Yes. Restaurants and, and time out experience first and then the food, which yeah. obviously is different. Like there are tweaks that will make your experience different to, to the restaurant. And once we, we start having a good feedback from our regular customers, from the people that know 21 grams and say, okay, guys, this is great. This for some people even better than, than restaurant. More convenient than restaurants yeah, exactly. as well. Different, convenient, different experience. That gave me a lot of confidence to, you know, and it gave me that um, that insurance that I need to say, okay, this this was a good decision. I think it was a great decision, if you ask me, because I think that you also there have to hold your own against other concepts and other brands, <laughs> exactly. uh, which which I think is an interesting challenge that you wouldn't face at Twenty One Grams headquarters. Let's call it that, because I'm coming purposely for you. 
I may not be coming, I may be going to timeout because mm -hmm. timeout is well known. And then I stumble into something called 21 grams and then try it. And that's a very different experience. It is, it is. But you know what? And then there's the alcohol element yeah, as well. Exactly. So this, basically the timeout market is the only place in Dubai where you can have a chewapi or kebabs with a glass of beer, yeah. which is the way how we consume it back home, right? Has so, that happened? Is that how people and, are consuming it? I'm, I'm sure. Like, you know, I was the first person. When, the moment we put the chewapi in the menu, the very next thing was going to the bar and ordering the beer, <laughs> sitting there. I said, like, okay, the moment this is has how come. It's to be the done. time has come. I'm super, super happy for this. And, yeah. you know, I want to share this with other people, this, yeah. this kind of experience. Uh, but again, going back to your thoughts as well about competition, being competitive there and so on. You know, it's a community place. Yes. And Very before so. we're saying, okay, we want to build community with our consumers, with the guests, we need to build community between ourselves. Yes. Vendors first, and then we are, you know, it's inner circle, it's an inner layer of the, of the bigger. And it's a great collection of and most the entrepreneurs have started their own brands, etc. So et great brands, but as well, I have to say, the great humans, yes. honestly, like lovely people running these places and, and bringing the energy to the place. How do you manage to have a balance in your life? I mean, you are... I have no balance. I have <laughs> to stop you right there. I, yeah. have, I have no balance. No balance. I'm, Does that you bother know, you or is that it, conscious? It, uh, no. So it, I was it, reading it, something yesterday. Sorry to interrupt yeah, you. Go. Actually, it was a, a, a Tim Ferriss podcast. And the guy on it was a known actor, but it was a very interesting point. He said, when you start a new brand, and he saw himself as an actor, Hugh Jackman, as a, as a brand, the first five years... Throw it away because you're essentially, that's all you're doing. There's nothing else that matters. After five years, you may be able to extract yourself a tiny bit here and there, or maybe you have a competent manager or et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Has that been your experience? Yes. Okay. And luckily, I'm in that fifth year exactly. now. So. so are you seeing any change? You were here with us I, this I'm, morning. I'm, I'm seeing the opportunity. Okay. At least I'm seeing that little window where I can do that. But for the past five years, there was absolutely no balance in my life. I'm half woman, half to do list. <laughs> honestly, if not I like, love that. honestly, That's if, if not, if not more than that, half my therapist, woman, my therapist, to do list. Yeah. yes, my therapist says that like, Stasha, you're to do list <laughs> person. Like, that's it. Like, stop it. Like you, what does nothing. your husband say? Oh my God. That's another <laughs> story. Okay, that's, another you, you know that. I have to say, yeah. my husband moved back to Serbia. So we are doing a distance marriage. Mm. And this is one of the things that I... He said you have no time anyway. See what happened. Like for this business to stay here in Dubai around this business, I let my husband go. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I'm doing distance marriage just for, for my business. So if, if people think it's only about money, no, it's not. Yeah, 100%. The, the, that's the cheapest thing that I invested into this business. Mm. I invested life, marriage, my social life everything my free time into this do you think it was worth it do you look or you look most back of and the say, times i do okay. most of the times i do i do have a, I, ha, I do have days uh, if not weeks where i mm. question everything where when, when i wake Fair. up and think is, is it worth it why i'm doing this um but I you do, probably I do, wouldn't do it any other way would you if i would put you back now five years if i would rewind the time I mean, you know what yeah. I mean? I, I'm just also trying to reflect on my own, on my own journey with the Lighthouse, which is also, funny yeah. enough, about five years. And, and I look at, I mean, I would have tweaked certain things, but I think when you believe in something and you want to do it, it's very, very different not to be all-consuming. I, I really think, in fact, I'm not going to say very difficult. I think it's impossible for, a, for it not to be all-consuming. Yes, I think it's impossible. If you want to do it in a way we did it, it's absolutely impossible. Yeah. You, you can't be there 80%. You can't no. be there 70% in order to... No, because you're constantly tweaking, constantly refining, constantly adapting, constantly changing. Um, and other people may be trustworthy, but they don't have... They don't see the vision of where you want to see this place. But let's, let's be fair as well. Like, especially if you're doing something for the first time, you're right? Correct. And you'd never done it before. Correct. You have to learn for yourself. Yes. It's not that you That's know everything. Point. Like, let's start from, from ourselves, not a team, not anyone else there. Just yourself. You have to learn. If you have to learn, you have to show up. You have to be there. You have to be there 120%. And then to get into position to teach someone else, to train someone else, you're setting up a business. You're setting up something. You're putting brick on brick and you're doing something. You have to be there. Yeah.
And there is no space and time for something else. If you're building a house, tell me, if you're building a house, like how much free time do you have? Yeah, no, yeah. you're fully focused at that. And you're building a house and you're building a home. You're building a home for so many people, not just for yourself. Are you able to sit down with yourself in some of the better days and at the very least recognize that and for it to give you the kind of, you know, just self, self-satisfaction that achievement comes with? Because I'm just asking this question because we all running all time. And as yeah. you said, half women have to do this, which is brilliant. But is there a moment... Uh, where you're able to sit down, even with yourself, and just say for five minutes, you know what, pat yourself on the back, get a sense of gratitude, a sense of achievement, or is it always for you, go, go, go? I mean, something I struggle with, yes. very open. And, so, and I'm open with, I struggle as well, big time, big time. And I talked about this with my therapist as well. Yeah, um, sure. I don't take this time. Unfortunately, yeah. I don't. I'm kind of pushing myself in the Constantly. past months and... and and, and years, but I'm still not there. I'm not doing that naturally. I'm not doing that by default. I was not taught that was never been my pattern before. I'm the overachiever. I'm the person that always, as we said, trying to do more. And for me, I'm reaching the peak of this mountain and I'm already seeing another one. And this is like what doesn't, what, what keeps me, you know, going and doesn't let me kind of, you know, yes, but if you uh, were, are seeing a therapist, it also means that you recognized that you wanted to change some of these patterns. Yes. Right? So I agree with you. Look, there's two sides to this coin. One is because you are this way, you are able to achieve so much, but it comes at the expense <laughs> so of something else. I mean, yes. Certainly, I feel that. So you've recognized that you wanted to change your pattern a little bit, right? I do. I do. I want these five or 10 or 15 minutes a day where I actually sit down with myself and enjoy the moment, if nothing exactly. else. Um, the currently what I'm, I'm on the path of forgiving myself for all the bad decisions that <laughs> I did, for all mistakes that I did. So that's probably the first step that yes. I forgive myself for everything that I felt yeah, that is you, not you, good you, enough. You keep hitting yourself on the head with. So this is, this is why I'm at now, like forgiving myself for so many things that now I know that I could have done better. But at that time, I didn't. So, do you, do you worry that it would slow you down if you were more forgiving of yourself and slightly more, you know, able to recognize that that you would not be able to move as fast and achieve as much? Is that a concern? N no, no. My no. current concern is that just that I simply don't know how to do it. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is like I simply don't know how to do it. And as I said, this is a the pattern that you got through your life. Sure, you've been repeating that. It helped you a certain period oh, of your life as well. At this moment, it doesn't work for me. I need to change it. Um, and I, I now when we are talking about this, I wish we really talk more about mental health yeah. for people being in business particular people being in the F&B business. In small business. I think in this, yeah, I think it's super, super, super important. No, that's yeah. why I asked. I think it is super important. And I think that uh, obviously what the outside world sees is usually the success and the quote-unquote sexiness of it all. The reality of it, it comes at a price. And I think I feel fi find that the more vocal we are about this and about this vulnerability and the, 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 the mental health toll that this has... Uh, the more people can go into this business and other businesses, frankly, when they're going on their own business and understand just the pros and cons, not have sort of one side. One of the main yeah. reasons we started this podcast yeah. was exactly that, is the focus to me uh, was always on the success stories. As So 21 grams, when it reaches here, when it won the awards, when it has the accolades. But there's a toll and there's a journey and we need to talk about that journey or else you're giving, frankly, a misleading picture. Not about 21 grams, but any business, Lighthouse included. 100%. This is what I've been saying to everyone. You see us, we, you see us now when we are at the point whatever M. Yes. But you need to see me when I was at A, B, C, D. And these points are up and down, up and down, up and down. And yes, I'm, I might be now talking about the courage and being brave and being fearless and being whatever. And yes, I've been at certain moments, but at certain moments I've been so down 
even if I can say depressed, of course. and I still do have these moments when I don't believe in anything I do, when I don't believe in no, the process, when I do, I'm questioning so hard, and I'm so hard on myself as well, yeah. that is actually very unhealthy. Yeah. But even from that position, I'm able to do certain things, right? Yes, you are, but you're also clearly self-aware enough to be talking about it. And wanting to do something about it. I mean, I think that's just also a very important point because you could be doing all of these things, but really deep in your heart feeling, you know what, anything less than that would be weak or soft or, but you don't see it that way. But and yeah. I, I mean, I have to say for a long time, my, long period of my life, for example, that's how I looked at myself and other people. So I would talk about wanting to have time off and mm -hmm. wanting to have, but really in the reality of it, how I really felt about it was that's the only way forward. That's the only way you succeed. And people who don't do that are not working hard enough. I've changed my mind as mm -hmm. I grew older, but it took a big mental shift to think of it differently. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I just read recently that someone told me like that basically the biggest um, thirst of human race is to be loved for who we are. Yes. But there is a trick. No one wants to show who we are actually are. We are all no faking. We are always making these images of ourselves and so on, right? We are not brave enough to really show yeah. who who we are, right? Yeah. So that's the trick. That's the challenge for all of us to actually show, yes, am I weak? Yes, I am. Let me show you. Like, honestly, like, I, I'm sure that all my stuff, they've seen me crying so many times. Even some guests saw me, could see, yeah, they did. And they don't have a problem. Yeah, Maybe yeah. I had it for the first time. Then I said, like, come on, am I a human being? I am. So yeah. I'll show you all my faces. Yeah. Because I'm an emotional being as well. And at the times, I don't control it well. I don't handle it well. But that's why we are humans. Are yes. you there for me? Are you there to understand this? Are you there to support me? Show me. Yeah. So I know, sh shall you stay in my life or not? I think that's great. I think it's, I can't think of a better ending point. Thank you for being so honest. Thank and you, And for spending the time with us. And we wish you all the best in your journey and hope to have you back. Uh, when you have become an ambassador um, and we'll all be coming and hanging out with you there, whatever, whatever they do and give ambassadors. So no, best of luck. <laughs> Thank I mean you. that. Thank you so much. Thank Sasha. you. We'll definitely you. see each other around our places, whether yes. it's the Lighthouse or 21 Grams. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for being here. Thank you for joining us on the Lighthouse Conversations with me, Hashem Montasser. We're produced by Chirag Desai and our content director is Farah Sharif. If you've enjoyed this episode, please follow us on your favorite podcast player so you don't miss any upcoming episodes. Also, feel free to browse our extensive collection of more than 50 previous episodes. I hope you enjoyed them. You can find us on Instagram at the Lighthouse underscore AE. Again, that's at the Lighthouse underscore AE or you can send us an email at connect at the lighthouse.ae. And please share a link with your friends if you've enjoyed this episode. I'll see you in two weeks.